Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this webinar on estimation of forest above ground biomass with Sentinel-2. My name is Evelina Dobnowolska, and I am Junior Remote Sensing Specialist at CERCO Italia, and I will guide you today through this exercise. So first of all, I would like to thank you all for attending today's webinar. We are going to explore the possibility to use Sentinel-2 derived vegetation indices in prediction of above ground biomass values in the forested area in Ethiopia. For this purpose, we are going to use Python programming language applied in Jupyter Notebook environment. This webinar is going to last about an hour and a half and it is recorded, so after the session will be over, uh, this video will be available in our YouTube channel and on our website, so you can also replay it later when you want to repeat this exercise on your own. So the outline of this tutorial is following. I will introduce you first the rules service and explain how you can access our virtual machines. Then I will move to presentation of the problem of today's webinar, so forest above ground biomass. Then I will um, move to uh, characteristics of Sentinel-2 satellite and its products. And finally, I will uh, go to the hands-on uh, case study to show you how this data can be used to estimate above ground biomass using Python script. At the end of the session, there will be dedicated time for the Q&A. So during uh, the demonstration, you can write your questions in the question tab of this uh, GoToWebinar application, and I will go through all of them and try to answer uh, to them later. Now, as you might already know, the Root Services stands for the research and user support for Sentinel Core products. And it is a project funded by European Commission and managed by European Space Agency with the objective to promote the uptake of Copernicus Sentinel data and support R&D activities. The service provides a free and open scalable platform in a powerful computing environment, hosting a suite of open source toolboxes, pre-installed on virtual machines, which allow you to handle and process the data derived from Sentinel satellites. So what does that mean? With the large amount of data produced by the Sentinel satellites, the challenge is no longer data availability, but rather storage and processing capacity. To solve that, RUS offers virtual machines so that you have the appropriate computing environment to handle the data. Last but not least, we also offer a specialized remote sensing help desk, which is there to answer any questions that you may have about which data to choose about specific applications of Sentinel data and so on. And then we also offer dedicated training activities, such as, for example, this webinar. The rules is divided uh, into two uh, categories. Uh, the first one includes training activities and the second individual users and R&D projects. The training activities include face-to-face -face trainings and virtual classrooms, webinars and support to webinar replay and also support to external, external training organization and operation. The participants of all the training events can take a possibility and advantage of limited number of remote desktop virtual machines, which are accessible to use from any computer. Regarding the individual users and R&D projects, Rules Copernicus provides support to individual projects through a new solution, which is a Docker container image. It contains the complete RUS virtual environment and tools, and it will be provided upon request. The container can then be deployed on users' own infrastructure, which can be cloud-based either in-house or acquired from a commercial provider. But it can also be deployed on a laptop or a PC. The ICT team is available to guide the users through the development procedure, and you can read more information about the Docker on the web page shown here. Now, finally, as you probably already know, Rules is implemented into two portals. We have the Rules-Copernicus portal, where uh, you can find all the information about the initiative, about the availability of virtual machines, and you can also register and request a virtual machine or the Docker container image. Then we also have the Rules-Training.eu portal, where you have registered for this webinar, and you can find here all the information about our past and future trainings. And for all the webinars, you can also um, have the recordings and the Q&A summary documents. 
Moreover, you can also check our e-learning portal and any news about our training activities here. Now, as I mentioned also at the beginning, any recordings of our webinars are also available on the YouTube on our dedicated Rules Copernicus training channel, and you can find them there in a few days after the event. Now that is all for the introduction to the Rules service. If you have any additional questions, please don't hesitate to let us know. And let's now move into the introduction to the topic of this webinar. First of all, you may ask me a question, what is forest biomass? And for those who are not familiar with the forestry sector, biomass is defined by FAO as a mass of life or dead organic matter. And generally, it is measured in units of dry mass per area, so for example, tons or megagrams per hectare. Forest biomass includes mass of all parts of the tree, so not only the tree trunk, but also bark branches, roots, needles or leaves. And about 80% of the tree biomass is stored in the above ground biomass, which is defined as the biomass of living vegetation, both woody and herbaceous, above the soil, including stems, stumps, branches, bark, seeds, and foliage. So why do we measure forest biomass and why it is so important? Forest biomass is nothing else than the weight of the tree in the forest. So it is measured for economical reasons to understand how much resources we have in the forest. And if we know how much biomass one tree can produce, we will understand the tree growth cycle and plan the forest production. An increasing interest in measurements of the biomass is connected also to the ecological debate about climate changes and ways to mitigate them. Translating the biomass into carbon mass will allow to estimate how much carbon can be sequestered by the forest and finally reducing carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And how do we measure biomass? There are two main methods found in the literature and applied by forest managers and owners. So first method is destructive method, direct method, which requires harvesting a tree, slicing it into separate parts, drying them and then waiting. This method has the highest accuracy, but also requires a lot of labor. So indirect methods, non-destructive methods are preferred among the forest managers and owners, and they are based on the sample plots measurements. So basically, a forester has to measure the breast height diameter and the height of the tree. And with the use of biomass factor, which is defined for each species and also accordingly to the region in which the measurements are taken, uh, these metrics are applied then into allometric equations, which can be then applied to the whole stand. And uh, like this, we can predict the biomass of the whole forest stand. The pros of this method are that it is cheap and easy to apply, but it has also lower accuracy and high variability of the results related to the conditions of the measurements. Now, how to apply remote sensing to the above ground biomass measurements? So there are two ways to do that. The first one is regression. So this will be the method we will apply today. Basically, we can have remote sensing parameters, which in our case will be vegetation indices derived from uh, Sentinel-2 data, but we can apply them uh, from different remote sensing uh, sensors and we relate them in the regression model to the above ground reference measurements and we apply them to the whole acquisition of the image. So in our case, our above ground uh, biomass reference measurements will be based on the uh, global data set prepared by ESA Biomass Climate uh, Change Initiative, which is publicly available and it is basically a raster file which contains uh, above ground biomass measurements represented in pixels in tons per hectare. The second approach requires the conversion from forest parameters to above ground biomass. So for example, we can estimate the tree height with the LiDAR canopy height model and use this relationship from the tree height to above ground biomass and use it to estimate um, the biomass on the full scale of the image. Now I will move to the Sentinel-2 characteristics. 
And in this exercise, we would like also to apply multispectral imagery provided by Sentinel-2 satellite. Sentinel-2 mission carries a passive sensor and it is formed by constellation of two satellites, Sentinel-2A and Sentinel-2B. They are passing at the polar orbit phase at 180 degrees to each other, and the multispectral instrument it carries has 13 spectral bands in frequencies of the visible near-infrared and shortwave infrared parts of the electromagnetic spectrum. The satellite provides data in a cycle of five days at the equator. It is characterized by the various spatial resolution based on spectral band from 10 to 20 and 60 meters. Let me introduce you to the topic of this exercise. So the objective of this exercise is to estimate above ground biomass in Ethiopian forest in the area of Bale Mountains National Park using Sentinel-2 image as an input and machine learning regression models to predict the above ground biomass values. And as a reference uh, values, we will use a global data set prepared by ESA Biomass Climate Change Initiative. And in the PDF guide, you have step-by-step -step procedure how to download this data. And uh, for the processing of our image and for the machine learning regression models, we are going to use a Jupyter notebook applied from Anaconda uh, distribution. And we will use also Python uh, script in this Jupyter notebook to run the exercise. We are going to use as well a Snappy module, which is um, a package uh, based on Snap software. And to atmospherically correct our image, we will use send to core plugin installed in our SNAP. So now we can move uh, to the practical part of this uh, webinar and we will move to our virtual machine. So once you have made a request for virtual machine at Ruth's website, then you will receive the URL address to access the virtual machine from your internet browser simply using the link provided by Rose together with login details. And here uh, you will see once you uh, insert uh, the, uh, the URL uh, address, then you will see this web page uh, where you will uh, insert your credentials. And then uh, you, you just uh, confirm with login. So now I will uh, just increase the size of the uh, virtual machine. And uh, uh, now uh, we are in the Linux environment, which uh, has very similar structure as your local computer. First of all, you will notice that virtual machine comes with um, different uh, softwares already pre-installed and ready to use. So uh, you have here Jupyter Notebook, Snap, QGIS, RStudio, Visual Studio, and uh, much more. It comes also with a file manager system uh, where you can navigate uh, through um, yeah, the, the files. Uh, it has also internet browser. And what you need to remember is that when you use internet resources um, in this virtual machine, then um, um, they are internet resources provided um, and defined within the virtual machine, so you don't use your local uh, internet um, uh, to, uh, to browse uh, through the web websites. Uh, here also you need to remember that uh, we do not use our own um, memory to store and process the data. Everything what we do on virtual machine is stored in the cloud. So, to start our exercise, we need to first navigate to the uh, folder which contains the uh, training, the files um, which are needed for this training. So, uh, to do that, we need to navigate to the file manager system. Uh, here we go to shared training and we open a training uh, folder which is called pi02 underscore forest biomass underscore sentinel2. We open it. And here we can see three subfolders. First subfolder is called uh, auxiliary data. We open it. And here you can see uh, the files which are needed as input files to this exercise. So first uh, you can see the raster um, 
the, T, the GOT file, which is um, a reference raster derived uh, directly from the Biomass uh, Climate Change uh, Initiative. And you can see also it's a uh, resampled and subset version, so uh, for, for you to use it later um, to compare your results with this reference uh, raster. Here you can see uh, the Conda environment YML document, which uh, will be used for you to replicate the Conda environment used for this exercise. And here I have stored uh, points shape file, which are basically um, the points coordinates uh, together with the reference value of above ground biomass for 2017 for the area of study. This shape file contains 200 uh, randomly sampled uh, points over the study area, and then later they will be used um, as a training data to our regression models. Next file is an um, IPY and B file, which uh, means that uh, this is a document of Jupyter Notebook. And uh, um, in here you have all the script required to run the, the exercise. In this text file, you have all instructions how to set up uh, Conda environment, how to uh, configure uh, Snappy. So I will not lose time on that uh, now and um, we will access Conda environment directly. But uh, you have all the step-by-step -step, um, uh, instructions prepared here and as well in, uh, in the PDF uh, tutorial. Now in the original subfolder, you can find uh, basically three, uh, three files. First of all, this is original file um, derived from the Copernicus uh, Open Access Hub. This is an input um, Sentinel-2 uh, image required in 1C level, as you can see. Uh, here you have its um, unzipped uh, format, so safe uh, file which is required later to do atmospheric correction. Uh, Snappy uh, and send to core plugin cannot uh, process the zip file, so that's why I have uh, unzipped that for you. And here uh, you have already pre-processed the um, uh, Sentinel-2 image, so the atmospheric correction has been uh, done uh, by me before, so now we will not lose time to, to perform this atmospheric correction as it takes more than 30 minutes uh, of time to process in virtual machine. So as you can see, those files, they are uh, just uh, the difference is that this one is, are, is still in 1C level and this is already in 2A uh, level, so after pre-processing required for that. But uh, let me show you quickly how to download it in case uh, you need other data, for example. So you go first to Applications, then you go to, uh, to Network and you open Firefox Web Browser. And in the first tab, you have already the address of, um, uh, of the website of Copernicus Open Access Hub from where uh, you can download uh, freely available Sentinel uh, products. So to do this, uh, you just need to open, um, open Hub of Sentinel missions. And here on the right, uh, you see the, um, the login icon. Uh, you need to click on that and just log in with your credentials. Once you are logged in, uh, you need to navigate here um, in this interactive map. Uh, you need to navigate to our study area and our study area is located um, in the central south of uh, Ethiopia. So we will uh, navigate to this uh, uh, area and it's here. So I need to just uh, zoom a bit more. And to draw uh, a polygon, uh, 
You can do it uh, with uh, your uh, right click uh, with your mouse and just drag and drop um, the rectangular shape of the, uh, of the study area. Here you can precise uh, the selection, the searching criteria. And um, we will use just one image um, for this exercise. Uh, so we need to define uh, only sensing period. It will be uh, the date um, in 2017, in January uh, 19. So I will uh, uh, only um, select a sensing period of this uh, exact day, because I know that the data then uh, will be uh, cloud free, so we can use it for our uh, purposes. So here in the sensing period, I select I select 2017 uh, January 19th, um, and as the uh, as the end uh, period um, is the same date. And here I will just um, check the uh, this checkbox with mission Sentinel-2. So we will search only for Sentinel-2 uh, data. Uh, I will leave satellite platform product type relative orbit number and cloud cover um, free uh, without uh, blank, without uh, any specific parameters. Uh, but uh, you can always uh, specify here the product type, for example, 1C level to A level. Uh, here you can specify which um, uh, Sentinel um, satellite mission do you want to use, or 2A or 2B. And you can also say that you want to uh, have cloud-free data, so here you specify the percentage of uh, cloud cover you want to search for. Uh, so, uh, for our purposes, uh, this is uh, um, sufficient, because I know that this uh, search will only return um, one image. So, uh, we click on the search icon, And here we can see our product. Uh, we can see the, the extent of the whole uh, product. Uh, so it is a bit uh, more than only forest area, but uh, we will use um, as well uh, this whole uh, image. Um, what is important? Uh, you can see now that uh, this um, product is it's, uh, it's, um, in the gray background, and here you have written that the product is offline. What does it mean? It means that when you want to download it with uh, this icon, it will uh, directly move uh, to your card. So uh, then um, you have a confirmation that the offline product retrieval um, has been initiated. And uh, now this product is saved uh, to your card in your profile because you logged in. Uh, and after uh, several hours, or maybe after one day, this product uh, will be available, because this is um, um, an uh, archive uh, data. Uh, so this is the reason why I stored uh, this product already, so you don't need to uh, wait with the exercise and you can uh, just uh, uh, move on with that. Then when you go to your cart, here you have a little uh, symbol of uh, of the clock. Uh, now it's it's uh, it has a status of pending, but uh, once it will be available here, um, it will turn out uh, green, and uh, the download and you can uh, then select it um, select it from here and uh, click download. Then the the download will be um, proceed. So for now we can close it and we log out. And the third uh, subfolder uh, in this tutorial kit is processing file, uh, where I have already prepared uh, separate folders for your um, results. So here you can see uh, the RGB folder, uh, they are all empty. But uh, you have already um, folders named to store your uh, processing data. So here you will store your band composites, 
Here you will store the, uh, the processed uh, image. So after the subset and uh, resampling of the Sentinel-2 product. And uh, in this folder, you will store um, the vegetation indices uh, calculated and uh, you will save them as GeoTIFF later. Okay, so at this point, we are ready to start the next part of our analysis. And as you might know, this exercise will be done using Python script implemented in Jupyter Notebook. And also for you to know, we will be using an Anaconda distribution to access the Python programming language and to install Anaconda environment uh, Python dependencies. So if you are new to Anaconda and Jupyter Notebook, briefly described, Anaconda is a free and open source distribution of the Python and R programming language. And apart from programming, it allows also to manage the packages and libraries. So we have Anaconda available at our machine, virtual machine, and we can access that uh, by terminal. So when we open, when we open it, we are in the base of a Conda environment. Uh, and I leave you also um, the environment in the auxiliary data folder, so later you can replicate it. But uh, for today's purpose, uh, we will already uh, move forward, so we will directly access our Conda environment, which is already instant. So to access the environment, uh, we need to just type Conda, activate and the name of uh, our Conda environment created for the purpose of this exercise, which is uh, pi02 uh, underscore AGP. Then we press enter. And now you can see that uh, uh, this uh, base Conda environment has changed into pi02 underscore AGP environment, which is inside those uh, brackets. So uh, with this, you can understand that we are inside uh, our Conda environment and it is uh, activated. So now to uh, access Jupyter Lab, it is also uh, pre-installed for you. So you, you just need to uh, type Jupyter Lab and press enter. And at this point, we can access the interface of the Jupyter Lab, which is the new version of Jupyter Notebook. So it has some improved capabilities, as for example, this um, file browser here. But I will not lose so much time on the explanation, how it works, because we have already uh, prepared uh, tutorials about the Jupyter Notebook, and uh, there you have um, more details about it. Uh, I will leave you later a link uh, to this training, so uh, you can watch it. Uh, you will also have links to the documentation of the Jupyter Lab and Jupyter Notebook, so you can uh, also read more about uh, this environment. Just for your information, by launching the Jupyter Lab from the Conda environment, we can access not only the Python programming, as you can see, different versions of Python are available, but also our programming language. Um, and here um, we need to, to start to work uh, with Jupyter Notebook. We need to just um, navigate to our uh, Jupyter Notebook uh, file, which is here. We just uh, right click on it and we choose open. So here we have our uh, web document open. We can uh, just extend the view so you can see it better. And I will not go uh, too much into detail how Jupyter Notebook works, because uh, we had also already described it in our previous uh, webinars. So here I will just uh, go very quickly. So here, as you can see, we, can, uh, we have a kind of web document which contains uh, text, links, images, for example. Here you have some tips. Um, uh, and the code cells as well, executable code cell. And what is the difference between the executable code cell? Uh, you can see the difference in their background. As you can see, the code cell is, uh, um, has a kind of gray background. And it has this little um, square brackets on the top of it uh, here. And once you execute this code cell, 
Uh, here, um, the number which indicates the order in which the cell has been executed will appear. So when we run this, this code cell as a first, uh, here, um, small number one will appear. And to run the code cell, you just need to um, place your pointer inside the cell and press Ctrl uh, and Enter. You can also do it uh, with run and run selected cells, but we will use over this exercise, we will use this uh, shortcut. And here, when you double click uh, on the uh, text, here you have editable version of this uh, of this document, uh, so you can see here how this um, uh, these sections uh, have been written. And we press Ctrl Enter, and it's executed. So first of all, here you will have um, uh, the background of the problem of to today's webinar. I left you also some links, for example, to characteristics of Sentinel-2, Python and Jupyter Notebook uh, tutorials. And here you have the outline of the section of this uh, exercise. So, we, uh, so here you have uh, just a shorter version of what we will do, but uh, I will now go um, step by step um, with this exercise, so you will see. Okay, so uh, now, first of all, we will uh, load all the modules required for this exercise. And as you can see, on the left side, you have a module name, and on the right side, you have a short description what each of the module does. Basically, the most important modules used in this exercise is Matplotlib to, vis uh, to create visualizations, uh, pandas to, um, to manipulate and analyze the data, NumPy for uh, scientific computing, Snappy module, which is very important for the pre-processing of the Sentinel-2 image. Uh, we have also Rasterio to work with uh, raster data, uh, raster stats, which will create uh, zonal statistics for um, the extraction of pixels. Um, and uh, GeoPandas, which is extension of the uh, pandas for the geographical uh, databases. And what we will do, we will just press Ctrl Enter now, and we can see that the kernel is busy because uh, it has a gray uh, background here, and also here it was a little asterisk inside the brackets. And as I told you, when the code cell is um, has finished, and now you can see a small one uh, inside those brackets, so it indicates that the code cell has been run. As an output, we can see that uh, all the modules were loaded, so uh, everything is, um, is uh, proceed. So now those modules are ready to use um, in our Python script. And now we move to the user input data. So this is the part where some editing will be required from your site when you want to use the script on your own data. For example, here we provide the input directory. So basically, it is a path to the original uh, Sentinel-2 data. Uh, we have also output directory where all output products will be saved. Uh, so uh, you can see that this is a processing file, uh, which I created for you. And uh, here we have defined the path to the input product for the atmospheric correction. So as I told you, uh, the send to core plugin does not read the zip file. So I have prepared here a path uh, to unzipped um, Sentinel-2 image file to its uh, metadata um, uh, file. And as the last, uh, we will load the path to the training data points uh, previously created also by me. Uh, so these are those random points uh, over study area, uh, which contains also the value of above ground biomass from 2017 for the study area, derived from uh, a reference raster from um, a Biomass Climate Change Initiative. And to run this cell, also I will just press Ctrl and Enter, and in a second, you can see that a second cell has been executed. We do not have output here, but uh, we do not have also error, so it means that 
everything is okay and the the um, the paths have been uh, saved under those variables in the virtual memory. So to facilitate the processing of the data and avoid the duplications of certain parts of the script, I have created some functions here in order not to have to repeat the same pieces of code all over the document. And the first function presented here is the function uh, which allows to write the band composites using Snappy module in Python. And as the first parameter, we will need to define the bands which we are going to use in our band composites here. Uh, then we need to define the path to the uh, image which will be stored, so the output name of the band composites and the format of this image. So we will use the PNG file as the output format. Next function will allow to create vegetation indices uh, using um, the rasterio package. And uh, here uh, we need to define also the raster output name under which uh, each um, uh, indices will be stored. Uh, here the index name. Here we need to um, also define the uh, color map output name because all the vegetation indices will be stored as well in a color map and the, the title of the plot, because we want to display at the end um, the vegetation index calculated. Here, this little function will allow us to normalize uh, the raster uh, produced, uh, the vegetation index uh, produced, because, for example, SAVI uh, index will produce a data which are over uh, one, uh, which is uh, out of the scale of the vegetation index. So we need to normalize it from minus one to one scale. Uh, then we uh, will define the zonal statistics function, which uh, basically will extract vegetation indices values based on the polygons buffers, uh, which will be created um, on the points. Um, and uh, here we just need to indicate the vegetation index um, name on which uh, this uh, zonal statistics will be performed, the path to the polygons which um, contains those buffer zones around the points which will be created and uh, uh, the output will be the vegetation index mean extracted from those polygons. Now here uh, we define the little function to uh, create a geodata frame of those vegetation indices uh, extracted and then the data frame um, which uh, will drop the columns contains geometry and uh, coordinates of the points which will not uh, be uh, no, um, which will not be needed uh, anymore. And the last function will create a geotiff. So um, uh, this will define um, the raster uh, size and the raster uh, bands, which will be written um, to the final output of the above ground biomass map created based on the, the uh, prediction uh, of the vegetation indices um, values. So now we will run this cell run also without an error. So now we can uh, proceed to the next step. Now we will move to atmospheric correction and as I have mentioned before, our Sentinel-2 image acquired for the date in January 2017 uh, was possible to download only in a level 1c, which is an image without atmospheric correction. So the atmospheric correction is required to proceed with this uh, image. And this step in the virtual machine takes about half an hour. So if you want to proceed without using, losing your time on pre-processing, on pre you can just skip this step and go into next sections. So into processing uh, section. I am using here basically the, uh, snappy, um, the snappy package to load a Sentinel 1C level product here. Then the atmospheric correction is done um, with Send to Core Toolbox version 280 or 
And as you can see, as a parameters, uh, I use, I specified only the resolution because I want to run the atmospheric correction on all resolutions of this uh, image. And here uh, I specify that I want to use send to core plugin with those specified above parameters and on the image uh, specified also here. Once the uh, processing will be done, I will receive um, um, I will receive a communicate that the, the pre-processing uh, has been done. So um, let's run it. And now it will take uh, some time, so I will move to the next sections to uh, just uh, describe you uh, what will be done here. So here in this step, after atmospheric correction has been um, saved in the original data direct directory, and the image processing will be done. So first of all, I will declare the path to the pre-processed image, Sentinel-2A level, as you can see here. I will read it into SNAP, and then I will perform resampling on this uh, image because um, the same spatial resolution is required for all bands in order to process them and later perform computations. So here I will set the parameters for resampling, for resampling and as you can see, a resolution of all bands will be set to 20 meters. Then here with the function, with the, uh, function resample, um, I will place those parameters and I will uh, place here as an input, the image uh, atmospherically corrected. Once the product will be resampled, I will print uh, resampled um, uh, here as, uh, as an indication that uh, the resampling has been performed. Next, uh, the subset of this resampled product will be created. Uh, so as a source bands, I will just choose the bands that will be useful for me later for the analysis. So I will use the band 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 8, 11 and 12. And I will not uh, make any um, subset uh, in order to reduce the area. We will use uh, the whole image for this. Uh, here I will only state um, that all the bands need to have the same size. So the height and the weight of the raster will be the same. Um, and once the subset will be created, uh, I will also place a, a communication about that. So uh, we will print um, the output that subset uh, was created. And also, uh, for you to know, we will save those products as a, a DIM file, so as a beam uh, DIM up. Uh, the, um, the DIM format is the format of SNAP. And uh, uh, we will also uh, save it as a GOT file uh, for us later to use it uh, with uh, other different um, Python modules. So I will press Ctrl Enter and let's run it. While the processing is uh, being run, I will describe you next uh, part of the script, which is band composition. So in this uh, step, we will finally visualize our uh, product. So we will create a band composition. Uh, and to do that, we need um, as well uh, here, we, we will need to, uh, to place our subset product. So once the previous uh, processing will be done, we can uh, place here our subset uh, GOT product. And we will read it again into SNAP and we extract each band separately from this uh, image. So we will uh, define each band giving uh, it a name. Uh, here we will start with the uh, creation of band uh, composites. And as you can see, again, we will use for this uh, Snappy. We set here um, a path to the band composites where they will be stored, as I, can, as I uh, have told you before, they will be stored in the processing and subfolder RGB. Image format for all band composites will be PNG format. Here are some Java type definitions required for image uh, generation in Snappy. And here, uh, 
is a function which was previously defined, right band composites. You can see here as input I placed uh, for the first band composites, uh, it will be natural color, so it will be uh, used band 4, 3 and 2. Uh, here I will place the path to, uh, to um, store the uh, band composites and the name of this uh, file which I reproduce and here the format of the image. And I will do that for uh, all other two band composites. I will produce also false color band composi composite and um, a second false color band composites which um, underline the healthy vegetation. And this use a near and short with infrared um, band as well as blue band. Uh, so I will create here a GIF from the list of uh, PNG files and for this um, I am going to use um, Imageo uh, module. And the GIF will be also saved uh, locally uh, in the RGB uh, folder. And now you can see that uh, the GeoTIF products and uh, subset products um, have been written. So right now we can proceed uh, with the reading as I described to you before of the subset product. And now uh, we can also proceed with creation of band uh, composites and saving them as a GIF file. Okay, and you can see now that the band composites have been written and RGB bands also have been saved as a GIF file. Uh, so here, how to display um, a GIF like that? You can just double click on this, um, on this cell, which is, as you can see, a markdown cell. And uh, uh, what you can do, you can just drag and drop it from uh, your folder where the image is stored. So in this case, it is stored in our RGB subfolder in processing. So when you drag and drop it uh, inside this markdown cell and then you press Ctrl Enter, you will have um, this image displayed as an animation like that. So now we can move um, to actually aim of this training. So as I have told you before, the estimation of forest above ground biomass here will be done using as predictor Sentinel-2 derived vegetation indices. So now we have to calculate them. And vegetation indices are nothing else than mathematical combinations of two or more spectral bands, which enable to underline the spectral properties of green vegetation so they can be easily distinguished from other type of land cover. And here uh, you can find some background about this vegetation indices, you can read it later. And uh, for all the computations of the vegetation indices, we will use a rasterio module. First of all, uh, we just need to uh, here list a subset of the, uh, the, the list of the bands in our subset product. Uh, so like this, we can access uh, the exact index of each band in our product. And with this information, we can read each separate band uh, to Rasterio. Uh, so you can see we will call uh, the band 4, which is red band, by its index, which is index number 3, as you can see, 1, 2, 3. And like this, we will proceed and we will um, also uh, read in here the red edge band, band, four, uh, band, band 5, uh, band 8, which is a near infrared band, and band 11, which is shortwave infrared band. And here uh, we set the path to our output uh, file with vegetation indices. And to run it, I press again Ctrl and Enter. Here you get warning message, but it is only warning about Rasterio, so you can just uh, skip it. It is not an error. In this place, we will calculate uh, the first uh, most commonly used vegetation index, a uh, normalized difference vegetation index. Uh, known as NDVI, which is usually the basic vegetation index when it comes to forest and vegetation monitoring. It is a ratio of red and near infrared band. Uh, in case of Sentinel-2, it, it uses band 8 and band 4. 
And as you can see, uh, here I stated the equation of this, uh, of this um, uh, vegetation index. And the creation of this index will be done using the, uh, the predefined function in the section 3. And uh, we will save our product as a TIFF. Uh, here we state the name of this TIFF. Uh, here we state the equation based on which uh, the image will be produced. And here the, uh, the name of the PNG color map, which will be also saved. And the uh, title of the plot um, or when we display uh, the results of this um, calculation. So I just press Ctrl and Enter. What is important to underline is that the value of NDVI will always fa fall between minus 1 and 1, which uh, minus 1 indicates bare soil and uh, plus 1 indicates healthy vegetation. Uh, so all the vegetation indices follow the same rules that um, the higher the, the index value is, the healthier the vegetation is. Uh, so now we can see the uh, output of our product. We can see here uh, water, which has been uh, classified as without vegetation, which is correct. Uh, here you can see the bare land or um, some other mountainous area probably. And here you can see dense vegetation here in our forest. And now we will move to the next uh, index, which is Normalized Difference Index and the I-45, uh, which is an index related uh, to NDVI. However, it is characterized by greater linearity and shows less saturation at higher values of NDVI index, as a done NDVI index. And the formula of this index is also very similar to NDVI. Instead of band 8, it uh, requires band 5 in the mathematical equation here. And we run it uh, again because it follows the same rules as the NDVI in its co computation. So we just uh, press Ctrl and Enter and in a moment we will receive our output. You can see that the values are more or less similar, but here the water doesn't appear. You can see that the value of this NDI45 uh, index fall in the range uh, from minus 0.75 to up to plus 0.75. Uh, you can see that uh, here the forest was uh, better underlined, however, uh, as well, um, as well, in here, there is a, a good distinction of the land cover. Uh, next index uses a transformation technique that minimizes soil brightness influence from spectral vegetation indices, and it is called Soil Adjusted Vegetation Index. Apart from uh, near infrared and red bands, it also uses L parameter, which, is, which stands for uh, Soil Brightness Correction Factor. And for Sentinel-2 images, uh, usually this value takes, um, uh, this, uh, this parameter takes value of 0 0.428. And this formula is uh, stated here. Uh, also, in this case, the um, soil adjusted vegetation index needed a normalization from uh, to set its values from minus 1 up to 1 in order to compare it later better with all other indices. So we just uh, press Ctrl and Enter to run it again. Okay, now we can see the results that they are very similar to NDVI. Um, uh, the visualization is uh, very similar. Uh, you can see that values are reaching 1 and uh, they go from minus 0.75. You can see also good distinction of the water area here and uh, the forest as well. Uh, the next index is Normalized Difference Moisture Index, which is very robust vegetation um, sensitive um, uh, index. 
This enables to access the information about water content in plants and uh, mesophyll structure in the vegetation canopy. For this calculation, a shortwave infrared is used together with near infrared band and the index is very commonly used to evaluate vegetation moisture uh, decline during the drop uh, and for drop monitoring. Uh, the formula is here, it uses band 8 and band 11 and uh, uh, it follows uh, as well the same uh, function and the same um, the same uh, procedure as uh, as other indices so i will just press ctrl and enter and uh, we will receive like this our fourth um, vegetation index which will be used as a prediction parameter to our above ground biomass you can see now uh, the results you can see that the water pops up very uh, well as it measures the moisture so um, that's why this area has been classified with the uh, with the high value. Also, forest has a value um, of about 0 0.4, which is also correct. Here you can see that um, bare soil pops up uh, so much with the uh, low values, which is also good because it allows uh, to better distinct these areas from the forest, for example. Next, um, after having all the vegetation indices calculated, we can create from them a unique raster stack to combine all the data together in order to, uh, to uh, proceed later with them as prediction parameters. So first of all, we need to list all the raster products uh, inside this output uh, file and we will do this with the, uh, with the GLOB uh, module and with the class GLOB. So I will just press Ctrl and Enter and you can see the list of our files in our uh, output folder. Now with Rasterio, I will copy the metadata uh, for the raster bands and I will create a new raster which includes uh, four bands um, uh, inside of it. So uh, we will save the raster stack in the output folder uh, here as a GOT file. Uh, so let's run it. At the end, uh, we will get an information, a metadata of this uh, GOT file. We can see that the type of this file is float32. Uh, uh, the width and the height, uh, as you might remember, is the same as our input product. Uh, here you can see the count, so this indicates the number of bands inside the stack. And the CRS indicates the projection system. So uh, this is projected in 39 uh, north uh, UTM zone projection system. So you can also have an uh, EPSG code uh, for that projection. Okay, so finally we reached the point where we can prepare our training data set, which will be treated then as an input to our regression models. And as I was mentioned in the presentation, we do not have field-based biomass data for purpose of this exercise, uh, which would be for sure a better uh, predictor for this regression models. But we will use freely available global data set of forest above ground biomass for the year 2017, uh, which has been prepared by ESA Biomass Climate Initiative. Uh, here you can find a link uh, which directs you uh, to this uh, database and all the steps how to download this data uh, will be included in our uh, PDF step-by-step -step guide. So I will not focus on this uh, so much right now. Uh, the most important thing is that uh, the data set, uh, we use raster for this in a GOT format, and it includes estimates of above ground biomass represented in tons per hectare. So each pixel represents um, some value of, uh, of above ground biomass in tons per hectare. 
Uh, now we can move to um, to import our training points uh, shapefile and as you can see we will use geopandas modules for this. Then we want to plot uh, to visualize our raster stack, uh, vegetation indices raster stack and we will plot above it uh, the points so you can see its uh, distribution uh, over the study area. So I will just press Ctrl and enter. Here you can see that um, there are summary of the attribute table of those uh, points uh, shape file. So you can see that we have 200 points. Uh, each of them, they have X and Y coordinates. They have also above ground biomass values, geometry and ID. And here you can see that they are more or less uh, distributed proportionally to uh, all the study are in all study areas. So they cover uh, forest, but they cover also uh, bare ground and water. So this is very important for our models because uh, uh, we cannot have only the um, uh, only clustered point in some part of the image, but we want to have uh, a more or less um, equal distribution over the image. Then, once we have our training points created, from this database, we will create now a buffer zones around those points to create a polygon which will cover more or less about five pixels around these points. And based on those uh, small areas, later we will extract the mean values of those pixels, so of uh, those vegetation indices values which fall inside uh, the polygon. So like this, we will have a mean value because it can happen that a point fall inside the, the, val the cell that has a value zero. It uh, cannot happen, but uh, maybe with different databases, you can have these problems. So like this, we will take a mean value, not the value of um, the single pixel. So here, as you can see, we first uh, make a copy of our points shape file to then create a buffer of 20 meters with this uh, with this function geometry.buffer. Uh, then we will save our point, uh, polygon uh, buffer uh, to our auxiliary data folder. So you will see it uh, here on the left. Uh, and now I will just run it. And here you can see that we have already our shape file created. Now, uh, each vegetation index band will, will be read as a numerical raster uh, array in order to perform later zonal statistics of selected pixels. So first of all, we will read all the indices separately and then we will uh, create zonal statistics uh, on those vegetation indices. As I told you, the mean value of each uh, vegetation index will be extracted uh, in this way. So I press uh, Ctrl and Enter. And now this code has been executed. So now we can move to create the small data frames as I uh, have described before in the user defined functions that uh, there were little function to create geo data frame and data frames. And now we will use it. As you can see here, we will use this function. So basically we will extract, um, we will uh, save all those mean values into separate geo data frame. And then we will drop the information about geometry and about pixel uh, and about points uh, coordinates and we will um, save each value of the vegetation indices uh, into separate columns so as you can see we will um, change here with this uh, fun with this uh, command we can change the name of the column and we will uh, change it from min to ndvi not to uh, then confuse them with different means of different vegetation indices. And we will uh, proceed with uh, all of the uh, vegetation indices in the same way. Then we create um, the training data set uh, unique uh, data frame, which will contain all those four uh, small data frames. We will join them based on the ID. Uh, and here uh, we also will uh, remove the um, columns which uh, are repeated over uh, different data frames, as in here. And we will save it to the CSV uh, file later to use it. So I will press Ctrl and Enter. 
and you can see now results of our extraction of pixels. You can see that uh, the values more or less correspond one uh, to another. You can see that, for example, AGP value zero corresponds with the low values as well of the vegetation indices. And in the contrast, you can see here very high value of above ground biomass, 320 uh, tons per hectare. Uh, and here you see that NDVI has also very high value, so uh, above 0 0.7, uh, and as well SAVI, 0 0.86. Uh, so you can see that um, we can see first correlation between vegetation indices and above ground biomass. Now, each uh, statistical uh, computation first always comes with descriptive statistics of the training data sets. So we want to explore uh, what are the uh, relationships between the uh, predictor uh, and the dependent variable in our case. So in this case, we will compare, we will base our uh, comparison of the uh, data based on the person correlation coefficient value, R, which is, in this case, uh, will be represented with a correlation matrix heat map. So using correlation matrix, we can access not only information on how strong the relationship between eight, uh, above ground biomass values and uh, vegetation indices is, but also the relationship between um, each of vegetation indices, one with another. So now uh, we will plot it. Here you can see that the correlation between the vegetation indices and above ground biomass is above 0 0.79. And the strongest relationship um, is shown between a normalized difference moisture index and above ground biomass. You can also explore here uh, different values uh, between, for example, NDVI and NDMI, you can see the correlation is 0 0.9. You can see also very strong correlation between NDVI and NDI45. Uh, and like this, you can, uh, you can explore your training data set. Now we will move to see the linear relationship between vegetation indices and above ground biomass values. So first of all, as you can see, we will load our training data set CSV file, and then we will plot uh, each vegetation indices uh, to a scatter plot against the predictor variables, uh, which is predicted variables, which is above ground biomass from 2017. And we will assign different colors for uh, each uh, scatter plot. So now you can see it. And now you can see that uh, uh, all the vegetation indices have positive uh, correlation with the above ground biomass. So you can see here, uh, we could uh, have draw here uh, a kind of exponential uh, curve uh, to describe uh, this relationship. Uh, here it is more linear, as you can see. Uh, SAVI and HB, um, they have similar behavior as with NDVI. And you can see also the correlation between above ground biomass and uh, normalized difference moisture, moisture index, which is also similar. It is more or less linear uh, relationship. Finally, we reach to the point, uh, to the core uh, of this uh, training today. So uh, we will predict now above ground biomass values across, select, uh, across um, uh, study area using um, machine learning techniques. And as you may know, recently different machine techni learning techniques, for example, support vector machine, decision tree, or random forest are applied very often to estimate biomass values based on remote sensing data and field uh, surveys. And for above ground biomass estimation, um, non-parametric models are believed to show better prediction than linear regression models. But in this tutorial, we will explore uh, these two techniques. So first of all, we will run multiple linear regression model and then random forest regression model. But uh, you may ask me, what is uh, a regression? So it is basically a technique which evaluates the relationship between the dependent variables. So in this uh, case, above ground biomass values and independent variables called predictors. Uh, which, uh, for which we will use vegetation indices derived from Sentinel-2. And it can be used in many disciplines, for example, to predict house prices in the market and their relation to the location in the city, or, for example, to study environmental issues and forecasting 
global warming levels or sea rise level. So multiple linear regression estimates the relationship between um, quantitative dependent variable and two or more independent variable using a straight line. And as you can see, uh, here you have um, a basic equation for this uh, multiple linear regression model and y means dependent variable, uh, beta here uh, means the uh, intersect value, so the constant. And here you have a coefficients value, so the slope, uh, and x um, is a predictor for this model. So uh, in this case, uh, we can place, instead of uh, x1, we can place ndvi, x2 would be uh, ndi45, and so on. And in this part of the exercise, we will use Skikit Learning Library, which is a free algorithm library for the machine learning discipline uh, in Python. Uh, so now let's move it. You can uh, read also uh, more about multiple linear regression models um, and other machine learning models in the literature, which I will leave you at the end. But now well, let's move because we are running out of time. So uh, here I will load the predictor variables based of our, on our training data set, as you can see, and our dependent variables. So let's run it and they are saved right now. After uh, we load those, now we will move to uh, prepare the linear model from a scalar model. So uh, first of all, we prepare test and training data set because we will use the same data set uh, to then uh, let the algorithm split it. So we will use, uh, we will tell algorithm to take 30% of our data set and um, write it as a test, um, test data set. So to test our model later. Then uh, we will import linear regression model and uh, here we will uh, train it. Uh, we will um, uh, fit the training data frame to the model uh, prepared. And here with the y underscore predict, we will predict uh, the new values dependent uh, on the variable uh, x test, which is uh, test data which remained from the algorithm. And we will plot our results, we will plot the intercept value, we will uh, plot coefficients for all of the uh, predictors, and we will uh, plot also R-squared uh, score, uh, which will allow us to assess the uh, accuracy of the model. And we will place them in a data frame. So let's run it. Here you can see that our intercept is 16.26, coefficients here are uh, written in a vector. So for each uh, predictor we have uh, its uh, coefficient value and this is nothing else than this uh, beta 1, beta 2, which you can uh, later um, place it in here and you can, uh, based on those values, you can predict the dependent variables. And here we have R squared score, which is 0 0.76, which is quite good results, uh, taking into account that we are uh, making prediction based on the raster uh, data set, not on the field-based measurements. Now we move to non-linear regression model, which will be used uh, again to predict about biomass values. And uh, you might already know this algorithm uh, but, uh, from the classification. It is random forest, but in our case, we will use random forest regression, which is considered as one of the fastest machine learning techniques. Uh, and it, is, uh, it has very good results in prediction of biomass values. And this technique is based on decision trees, which facilitate the decision process. So the decision tree in uh, random forest is built in iterative way, so from roots into its leaves. And each tree in random forest is built with different defined algorithm by selection of random sample coming from predefined training data set. In our case, we will set three parameters to build our tree, and it will be number of estimators, which control the number of trees in the classifier, uh, maximum depth of the tree, so the limit uh, to, uh, to each uh, tree will be grown, and num uh, n underscore jobs, which is uh, which uh, allow to process uh, faster, so to use all processor to calculate the regression. 
And now we, uh, you can find also documentation about this um, in here in this link. And now we will load our features, so our predictor variables, our dependent variables. And now we will split again our uh, train and test data um, to 30%. Now from a random forest regression class, we will, um, uh, we will um, create our model. We will use 100 estimators um, as, uh, uh, as the maximum value. We will also set our maximum depth uh, to, to three. But later you can choose, also you can play around and change the values and see what happens with the model. Then we will feed our regression model into our training data. So now let's run it. You can see confirmation that the random forest regression was run. And now we will predict, predict our data of uh, dependent variables, so of our above ground biomass model. Here we will also plot the R square to compare it later with linear regression model. And as you can see, it has 0.72%. Uh, so uh, R square is um, uh, telling us information about coefficient of determination. So it is proportion of the variance in the response variable that can be explained by exploratory variables. Uh, so in this case, more than 70% of the above ground biomass can be explained by the vegetation indices, which is rather good. Here we will produce numerical values of the importance of each vegetation indices values to the random uh, forest final model. Uh, so here we will load again the list of predictors. Here we will uh, use the feature importances class to, uh, to plot each uh, predictor and its importance. And here we will, uh, we will just uh, set that um, it has to be created a list of the features and their importance, and we display our results. And this gives us already uh, plenty of information that uh, normalized difference moisture index had uh, highest importance in prediction of this model. It had 0 0.66, um, um, six, so 66% of the uh, above ground biomass values were predicted using a normalized difference moisture index. Uh, here you can also see that uh, important value was NDVI, SAVI as well, and the I-45 was the less important vegetation indices. Now let's move uh, next. And this step is the last step of this tutorial. We have created our machine learning regression models, and now we will use these models to create the final output. Uh, so here, uh, with this uh, piece of code, we will uh, basically we will uh, set the uh, path into our vegetation indices uh, stack. Then we will uh, also load again our training data set as a CSV file. Then we will uh, say the list of predictors, the predicted variable AGP. And now with uh, the GDAL module, we will open uh, the input raster and we will set, uh, we will assign the size of the raster, so rows and columns and number of bands to this raster. We will transform it and we reproject it to the uh, projection uh, needed because it needs to have the same as the output raster. Here we will convert it to the NumPy uh, stack to perform calculation. And we will assign a, a data type of this raster to float 32 because uh, we had also the same data type for our vegetation indices. Here we state the path to the output uh, product. And uh, now this is very important part. Uh, here you will state uh, which regression model you want to use to predict the values of a new raster. So here we will use multiple linear regression model and we will reshape it into the shape of the rows and columns numbers which we uh, stated here. And with create GOT function which was predefined we will uh, export classified image uh, as a GOT file and save it in our computer. So let's press run it. And you can see that it was already processed. And we will do exactly the same with the above ground biomass raster based on random forest regression model. But uh, what will change uh, here, we will just change uh, 
uh, the, uh, the model of regression which will be applied. So here you can see we will apply random forest regression model to predict our data. So let's run it also. And you can see uh, that uh, the processing has been finished. So now let's finally visualize our above ground biomass maps produced. Uh, here with this final step, we will just um, import here uh, above ground biomass raster derived from multiple linear regression model. So here we state the path. We will also uh, import uh, the statistics of this image. So we will see the mean man, uh, minimum, maximum uh, and mean value of the band uh, of this uh, image. So basically what we will see here, we will just uh, see that the mean value of uh, above ground biomass in this area is 83 tons per hectare. Uh, the median is 58 tons per hectare and maximum value is 336 tons per hectare. So now we can uh, see also how the the other raster behaves, uh, the uh, raster derived from a uh, random forest regression model. So let's uh, run it. And here you can see that the values are similar. Uh, you can see that minimum value, uh, however, is stated uh, as to just above zero, so three tons per hectare, which can be accept acceptable. Uh, so this uh, derived better prediction, I think. Uh, here the mean value is 83, so it is almost the same. And medium is, uh, median is a little bit lower, it's 48 uh, tons per hectare. And here we have 58, so um, the maximum value also is a bit lower. Uh, but uh, now we will plot the reference data. Uh, so the above ground reference uh, map for the year 2017 derived from uh, ESA, from the Biomass Climate Change Initiative, and we will uh, plot it next to the uh, above ground biomass maps produced in here. So uh, with this function image show, I will show you the, the images one next to another. Uh, we will set also the scale from 0 to 400 to have the same scale for, for comparison of the values. And here I will state the, uh, the title of the plots to not confuse uh, different plots. And let's plot them. You can see now, you can compare visually that uh, the um, multiple linear regression model predicted a very high values for the water uh, high values of biomass, and it can be caused uh, by the vegetation index, uh, normalized moisture index, which um, underlined very high uh, water content in the scene. Uh, here you can see random forest regression model uh, behave a bit uh, better. Uh, and you can see the reference map. So uh, comparing those uh, three, you can see that our results uh, are ac acceptable, even that we didn't have uh, the field-based measurements, um, we can also produce uh, significant results. So this was the last step of this tutorial. We have shown here possibilities to use Sentinel-2 vegetation indices applied in different regression models to predict biomass values over study area. Uh, this tutorial aims to present how different vegetation indices can be used together with publicly available data set and above ground biomass when we are missing field-based measurements to validate our models. So uh, you could see that significant correlation between all vegetation indices and above ground biomass has been found. You can also explore now different open source databases of biomass around the world and compare those values obtained here uh, with uh, the values which were calculated and which are uh, publicly available. Here I left you some uh, links to those uh, interactive maps. You can explore it when you have time. So thank you again for attention of this webinar. We now move to the presentation to some uh, conclusion and remarks, and then we will start our Q&A session. Thank you. Okay, so this will be the end of our session today of our webinar. Uh, I hope you have enjoyed it, and I hope for those of you who were not familiar uh, with the above ground biomass concept and how we can estimate it using Sentinel-2 data, uh, it was something uh, useful for you. 
uh, and also that um, you you have learned something how you can process uh, this kind of data uh, directly in Python and in JupyterLab environment. Uh, now I will move to the Q&A session to answer all your questions that you had during the demonstration of this webinar and also for you to, um, to remember uh, that this Q&A session um, will be saved together with um, our tutorial PDF step-by-step -step guide. Um, uh, it will be um, available in our training website. Another information is the training code of this webinar is PI02. So when you apply for uh, the uh, virtual machine, uh, you need to ask for, um, for a particular training. Uh, so um, the code for this training is PI02. Uh, here you can find also um, a contact uh, to us, our websites and uh, my email address if you uh, have some questions or you need some clarifications about this webinar you can just uh, write an email and uh, we will stay uh, in touch so thank you once again for your participation and now i will move to live uh, q a session <laughs>